Hey everybody, I'm Cheryl and I am the Carb Addiction RD. My story briefly is that I came to the world of low carb nutrition when I realized that I was gaining weight despite training for Ironman triathlons, mostly because I really liked the carb loading. Anyway, I stopped doing that, but my professional aha moment came one day when I was working in the hospital and I was sent to deliver some nutrition counseling to a man who was in the hospital to have his foot amputated as a consequence of poorly controlled diabetes. Now, he passed pegged me as a dietitian the second I walked in the room, and he told me to leave and not come back unless I returned with donuts. So in that moment, I realized that carb addiction is a real thing, and that so many people will go to all kinds of lengths to justify their consumption, even knowing full well the harm that they do. So I realized that for me, my career would take a different path. And how fortunate for me that shortly thereafter, Dr. Rob Sivis, who you all know is the carb addiction doc, was looking for a dietitian. So literally that was a match made in heaven. And now here I am, the carb addiction RD, and delighted to be a part of the conversation. So dietitians are trained to guide patients toward making appropriate food choices by detailing what they should eat. An addiction dietitian, however, helps guide patients towards understanding why they make the food choices they do. And exploring diet through this lens has benefits for other mainstream dietitians who might be seeking a different way to treat their patients. It has benefits for physicians who need to coordinate patient care with dietitians. And it can also be beneficial for lay people who are seeking a deeper understanding of carbohydrate addiction. But guys, we've got to get our heads out of the sand and understand that fundamentally this is about a carbohydrate addiction problem. And we need to incorporate that into our treatment plans. So if you go see a traditional dietitian, you will be presented with the my plate illustration. You will be instructed to make half your plate fruits and vegetables, a little bit more than a quarter grains, and a little bit less than a quarter lean protein. So that amounts to a low-fat, moderate protein, high-carbohydrate approach. But guys, what is the one macronutrient that so many people have difficulty processing normally? Yeah, it's carbohydrate. So what are we doing? Recommending a plan with up to 65% of the nutrient of the substance that we all struggle with, the substance that is driving carbohydrate addiction and our poor metabolic health. That's crazy. We've got to throw out these guidelines. So that's what I do when I meet with a patient. We throw out those guidelines and start with a different approach. So the carb addiction approach is don't assign blame to your patient for any lack of success. Instead, address root causes and incorporate a whole person approach to treatment. A person may come to you and tell you that they're a chocoholic, but if you introduce the concept of carbohydrate addiction, that often really resonates, right? The problem isn't carbohydrates. The problem is our relationship to those carbohydrates, right? We're not craving them because we're weak. We're craving them because our brain is telling us to, all right, where we can't focus, we're tired, or our mood is all over the place. And really, that's because we're riding that glucose roller coaster. So as a dietitian, obviously, I like to talk about food. But I understand that a lot of what I do is about helping patients transition away from using carbohydrates for their emotional restitution and toward finding other means of fulfillment. So the first pearl I'd like to talk about is communication, because that's such a key component of our patient interactions. You have to realize that so many times patients have had negative prior experiences with other healthcare workers. So your patient with you should feel heard, should feel understood. You need to meet them where they are, not where you think they should be. And remember, everyone has a story. Let them tell you what they need. But then your job is to help them realize that their way forward is to address that underlying carbohydrate addiction. Explore with them why they want to change their behavior. What is their internal why? What's driving this behavior change desire? And what are their pros and cons about doing that behavior change? Pearl number two, I like to establish where a patient is on the continuum of the stages of change. So at the top, you see the pre-contemplation stage. People there are in denial that they have any need for behavior modification. For example, that patient that I was talking about earlier. Contemplators realize that they would benefit from some behavior modification, and they plan to do something soon, but they don't yet have a concrete plan of action. 
someone in the preparation and planning stage has already begun to implement some changes. For example, they might have watched some YouTube videos, or maybe they're already decreasing their carbohydrate intake. But they still need a little bit of help, perhaps with menu plans or how to overcome carbohydrate cravings. Someone in the action phase has made some of those modifications already, but they're not really yet established habits. However, someone in the maintenance phase is really rocking their new plan. But it's important to note that you don't progress from one stage to the next in a linear fashion. At any point, someone may slip back and relapse to an earlier stage. So how do we help patients make that progression from one stage to the next? Education is key. The more a patient understands the why of the physiology, of the rationale, of why they're being told to make these changes, um, the more that they will incorporate it into their why and the greater their chance of success. So that ongoing feedback is really important so that we can have patient-centered discussions and personalized plans to help our patient have greater resiliency. Pearl number three, I urge you to keep things simple and clear. Overcoming addiction has far less to do with willpower than it has to do with the environment. So I ask someone who says they're a carb addiction, uh, a carb addict rather, to remove all the carbohydrates from their house if they can. If they're not in the house, then they're going, not going to be as vulnerable when they're home. Now, sometimes there are other family members who are still consuming carbohydrates. And if that's the case, then that will definitely be something that we'll address in future sessions. But then if that is the case for them in the now, what I have those patients do is to create a list of alternate activities and literally put it on the fridge. So the next time they're on a hunt for something, they can see that as almost like a stop sign. And they'll say, hey, wait a minute, I was going to have a snack, but maybe that is going to suggest to them that they might do something else. The other thing I like to have patients do is to create a SMART goal. Now, we all hear these vague statements, right? I'm going to lose weight or I'm going to get more fit. But without any concrete boundaries, it's really difficult to implement such a plan and it's impossible to gauge any success. A SMART goal, on the other hand, is specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. So for example, if I have a patient who is trying to replace carbohydrate consumption with walking, their SMART goal might be, I will intentionally walk 20 minutes a day until our next appointment in one month. So this is a great SMART goal because it's specific. It involves walking. It is measurable because they're going to be doing that for 20 minutes every day. It's attainable because this patient told me that that is physically possible for them, as it is for most people, not everyone, but for this person they say it's achievable. It's relevant because they're substituting walking for that carbohydrate consumption. And it's time-bound because it will be done for one month. And even better in this case, there's accountability because that patient and I will sit down in one month's time and we'll be able to assess their, their level of success with that goal. The important thing, guys, though, is to not implement too many changes at once. New habits disintegrate really quickly, so your job is to make sure that you give a pace to that patient that they can tolerate, because that way they will incorporate it long term, which is really what we're trying to achieve here. Remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. For pearl number four, I want to talk about a couple of different mealtime strategies. So the first concept is mindful eating. Mindfulness is an intentional focus on thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations in the present moment. And the goal is to become more aware of rather than react to situations and choices. So we've all done this, right? We eat on the run. We go through the drive through and we eat the food in the car or we're at home and we're not paying attention to what or how much we're eating because we're distracted by the TV or maybe you're sitting your meal at your desk at work. Um, here what I suggest is to really sit down at the table and use that knife and fork. It will help you connect more with your food and with your choices. So really make that table pretty. En enjoy the company of a dinner companion and, and really focus on the fact that this is your mealtime. The other concept that we talk about is sequential eating. And I ask patients this all the time. How do you decide how much you eat at any given time? Well, 
all we all do it, right? We put food on the plate and then we eat it because we're all clean plate rangers. All right, so what I suggest people to do is to take that same volume of food and split it onto two plates and take just one to the table and have that and enjoy it and then maybe take a 10 minute break. Uh, perhaps play a game of cards with your dinner companion or go for an after dinner walk, whatever it is, but take that little bit of a break and then assess how you feel. So many times patients tell me that they realize that they don't need any more food. And the bonus, of course, is now they have leftovers for tomorrow. All right, for pearl number five, I want to talk about habits. At its core, emotion management is about accepting who we are as imperfect human beings. Using carbohydrates as a drug of choice to deal with emotions prevents us from learning healthy responses and impairs our personal growth. So when a person is abusing carbohydrate to deal with their emotions, um, we can't just take away those carbohydrates because that leaves a void. We have to replace them with something else. And so the cornerstone of the way we practice is the development of an effort-based emotion management toolkit. So we'll talk about the five pillars of health and wellness, and these include physical activity, creativity, spirituality and meditation, healthy sexuality, and empathetic human connections. As your patients begin to employ these in their life, then they find that these activities may make them more productive or provide them with joy that has no metabolic consequence. And the more they practice these, the more that it reinforces their new habits and they become less vulnerable to their usual cues, emotions, and triggers. For pearl number six, I know you guys know this one, but in our experience, a snack is always an emotional event, right? Why do we snack? We snack because we're stressed, because we're bored, because we're happy, because we're sad, because we're celebrating or procrastinating or simply out of habit. But the important thing to note here, guys, is that you're going to get adequate nutrition from your mealtime. That snack is not providing you any needed nutrition. You're doing it for an emotional reason. So when you find yourself reaching for that snack, I want you to pause and really assess what emotion you're feeling in that moment and try and think about what else you might be able to do to help you get over that. Um, we recommend something that Dr. Zivas calls a bridge snack. So this is something that contains no calories, but it will provide you with that mind cleansing moment to get you over that period of time when you're looking for a snack. For pearl number seven, I want to talk about planning for success. The key is to plan a response for scenarios where a patient might otherwise derail. So some examples, again, these sticky situations are different for everyone, but some typical examples are dining out, cooking for others, social pressure, celebrations, and any individual triggers. So when a patient comes to you and explains a situation that they went through, I want you to kind of spend some time and think about with them what went right and what went wrong so that they can create a plan in order to handle that situ situation better the next time. Really, really key though, guys, is I encourage you to have the patient come up with their own solutions because the more that the solutions come from them, the more they're going to own that plan and the greater their chance of success will be. All right, for the last pearl, um, I think it might be even the most important one, is just to realize it's this ongoing thing, right? Starting a new habit is super easy, but it's that long-term change that's tricky. All right, so um, I know that right now we're, what, in the middle of January, so I'm thinking that there are probably a lot of New Year's resolutions that have gone by the wayside at this point. Um, despite people's really good intentions. So what I want you to do is to really empower your patient to own the changes that they seek. Empower them to be in charge of their own decisions. When a patient is in charge, they're stronger. Help them create their tribe. Provide ongoing support. So that's what I do. Um, a big part of what I do, rather, is uh, running empathetic social groups, social support groups. And having that accountability really keeps those patients on track. And it helps them so much to realize that they're not alone. That's a really big part of recovery. And ongoing attendance in these groups helps patients rebuild their lives as they emerge from carb addiction. So to conclude, adopting the model of carbohydrate addiction shifts the emphasis from blame and shame toward understanding, ownership, and a desire, not a need to change eating behavior. So throw away those one-size-fits-all therapy plans and instead employ compassion and individualized patient-centric discussions to facilitate behavior change. 
Remember, guys, this is a lifelong process filled with good days and bad days. But the key is to keep putting one foot in front of the other and to appreciate the journey. Thank you so much.